Hi, I'm Amber McDonald here at the Walden's Puddle in Jolton, Tennessee. Now this is a wildlife rehabilitation and educational facility for wildlife here in Tennessee. And we're so happy to have Bettina bauer Schwan, our director of the animals. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for coming out. We really appreciate you coming out to see us today. I'm so excited to see all of these wonderful animals that need some care or are injured and, and, and need to be re rehabilitated and brought back uh, into the wildlife. So let's go uh, take a look at some of those. Sure, we can go inside and, and look at some of our educational animals in the reception area. So Bettina, tell us about this first animal. This is Reno. Now he's an interesting character. Tell me a little bit about him. Well, Reno is an eastern screech owl, and they are the smallest owls that we have in this area. Um, this is a red phase of the eastern screech owl, and, and they, in this area they come in the gray phase and the red phase, and there's no really rhyme or reason why they're one color or the other. You can even have a clutch of babies with both colors in the same clutch. But uh, Reno is adult. This is as big as they get, and um, he was hit by a car and had a wing fracture that didn't heal well enough for him to be able to fly again. So obviously birds can't fly, they can't be released and hunt, and so that's why he lives here permanently now. It says that he's available for adoption. Now how does somebody come in here and adopt one of these wild? That is something that is unique that I'm sure a lot of people aren't familiar with. Well that's like a virtual adoption. Um, like you don't get to take him home with you because that would be illegal, um, but you just simply um, pay a certain amount a year for his upkeep and you get an adoption paper certificate and a picture of him. Now what are some of these uh, animals, I'm sure they eat the you know different different things, how do you provide uh, food and care and what do you rely on as far as taking care of a lot of these animals? Um, well of course with your birds of prey and your large carnivores they have to eat frozen mice, of course we thaw them, but we get them frozen rats and mice and um, you know some of our birds have to have you know, frozen fish, all of that stuff has to be delivered on ice, you know, and it's um, pretty expensive to, to get into us. And uh, we rely completely on donations. We do not get any government government funding uh, from any governmental agencies, although we're permitted and licensed by federal and state governmental agencies, we don't get any money from them. So we are totally reliant on donations. And here we're with Chester. Now he's a kind of a pretty looking fella. Can you tell me a little bit about him? And he says he's an educational animal. Tell us a little bit about what does it mean when these animals say that they're educational animals? Okay, Chester is an eastern box turtle. And um, this is a species that is on the decline um, because of lots of um, development, really. And also, you know, people just picking them up and trying to keep them as pets, moving them out of their areas thinking, oh, you know, I found this turtle in the road and I've got this great farm and I'll take it. Unfortunately, these guys are very territorial and so if you move them out of their territories, the chances are very high that they're not going to survive. Um, but by educational animal, that means that he is non-releasable and so um, he's been permitted to be kept as an educational animal and have contact with the public and do educational programs. Um, every animal that comes through our doors has to be accounted for. I have to file state and federal uh, paperwork at the end of every year for every single animal that comes through here and this year we've admitted over 2,000 animals. Now here is Hudson and he's also a screech owl. Tell me how he uh, came to the facility here. Well. We think he was probably hit by a car. Um, with most of these animals, we don't know for sure what happened to them. We just kind of have to guess by where they were found and what their injuries are, you know, as to what happened to them. Um, but he probably was hit by a car and um, suffered severe head trauma and eye damage. And so both of his eyes are affected. He is totally blind in one eye and partially blind in the other. So even though owls are great hunters and hunt as much by sound as they do by sight, he does not have enough sight to be able to hunt consistently and be uh, released back into the wild. He can fly and he could possibly hunt occasionally, but not enough to keep himself alive and he, he would starve to death if he was released. Tell me, who is this? This is Petunia and I think she's just, I think she's trailing yogurt all over me as we speak. Yogurt is a, a part of their diet because they do require a, lot, a good amount of calcium but they do like it too. It's a big treat. 
tree. Now, obviously, you can hold. Now, what animals can you hold and which ones are like, I don't think so? Well, squirrels generally are not holdable um, because even if they do are used to use somewhat, they generally do still bite and being bit by a squirrel is like being hit with a nail gun it's not fun they've got t teeth about this long and so it'll go through a finger in a heartbeat uh, opossums have lots of teeth they have 50 teeth and it's more teeth than any other mammal and they're sharp uh, but they're not real long so when they bite it's generally not a deep bite now, how did you get Petunia to get this this uh, people friendly with you? Was this a gradual process, or is this something that she was just always friendly? Well, unfortunately, she was always friendly uh, since we had her. She came into us as a juvenile opossum, and she'd been hit by a car, and she had skull fractures, which is not unusual. Um, most of our opossums that are hit by cars do come in with several skull fractures. I mean, we've had them with as many as 11 different skull fractures and survive. Um, so we don't know if it was a result of the car wreck or if she was possibly an animal that somebody had tried to raise as a pet and then just put back out into the wild. How many uh, volunteers do you have uh, within the facility or, or people on staff helping with the animals? Um, not enough. <laughs> Never enough. Um, we have staff-wise um, with our, our animal care staff pretty much Everybody that is on staff is animal care staff. We have a, a core group of about 20 volunteers, and um, those are people that some do come out on a weekly basis and some come out, um, you know, maybe twice a month, depending on, on what type of volunteering they're doing. Again, we could use three times that amount, and this is the time of year that we want to get our volunteers in so we can get them trained. These are Nighthawks. They're the same family as whippoorwills are, and they fly around at night and eat moths, and that's why their mouths are so big. Well, and this is the male. The male has the white around his neck, and the female has the buffy color around her neck. And both of these guys are non-releasable because one of, one of them had a wing injury, one of them had a coracoid injury that uh, left them unable to fly. Now, we have to hand feed them because they, they, fly, they eat on the wing as they're flying. So if they can't fly, they don't know how to feed. Um, so any birds in, that eat like this, swifts, um, chimney swifts, regular swifts and swallows, um, martins, and these type of birds are really kind of hard to care for in captivity because they lots of times don't understand how to self-feed if they're not flying and you have to to be able to feed them without stressing them out mm -hmm. while you're doing that. So that's, um, it's a fine line that you have to walk with, with them. Now, were they found together or they just happened to be? No, they weren't found together. Um, they were found separately. They just happened to, to be cohabitating now. Now, are they able to breed in captivity or no? Um, you know, I, they probably are capable of it. We haven't done anything to them. Mm -hmm. um, but they haven't, so um, I'm not real sure if they ever will. Mm -hmm. But I tell you, these little guys, when they're babies, are the cutest little things. <laughs> oh, look at him. <laughs> look, at his, his, look at the way he walks around. Yeah, so they have very short little legs. And they're, they're not birds, of course, that you see perching on limbs, you know, so much, or wires or things like that. They are generally on flat surfaces. So I understand you have some animals outside for us to see. Maybe a falcon or so you can take and show us around. Absolutely. All let's right. go and let's, let, let's go. Now tell me a little bit about this fella. He's he's actually missing an eye. Right. This is Maverick, our red tailed hawk. And uh, when he was brought to us, he was totally blind, um, had two broken wings and a broken leg. And everything we got everything healed up nicely we got the vision back in one eye but the the other eye collapsed and we did have to have that removed and so um, that makes him non-releasable um, so he is our educational red tail hawk and he has been here for um, I would say close to seven years now and you have uh the veterinarians that are on staff here, how many do you have that, that operate on? 
Well, we don't have any, any vets on staff. We do have two veterinarians that donate services to us, and we couldn't survive without them. Um, we have uh, Dr. Mike Corwin of Airport Animal Clinic and Dr. Brandon Dixon of Volunteer Veterinary Clinic, and they both donate services to us. Um, they do surgeries and exams and things for um, any of the animals that require it and do it for free and so it's you know like I said we we couldn't survive without them it's you know probably you know fifty thousand dollars worth of services they provide to us on a yearly basis now what does that mean that's a defense mechanism with a birds of prey great horned owls in general they'll clack that beak at you and they'll they'll hiss and then lots of times they'll bring their wings out and just tr and fluff up and try to make themselves look as big as possible to scare you off. Now, I'm sure he gets used to seeing you and some of the other volunteers. Does he do that to you, or is that just because we're here? Uh, no, no. She she does it pretty much kind of defends her territory. Whenever we go in there, she just wants to make sure that we know that, you know, she's she's still in charge. And, uh, you know, she, she does it. If, if she was really distressed, you know, she'd she wouldn't be calming down and they also flutter their um un right underneath their um well i guess in, in their throat area what would kind of be our throat area. they flutter that a lot if they're under stress too so she's just you know staking out her territory and letting everybody know who's boss now she's unreleasable because she's what cannot fly she cannot fly she was shot um and it broke her wing and so badly that it, it could not be repaired for her to be able to um, fly again. And uh, shooting uh, any bird is a federal offense. Birds are protected by the Federal Migratory Bird Act. And so um, whether it's a robin or a bald eagle, if you shoot it, you are, um, if, if we catch you, then you're, you can be prosecuted by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. And pay thousands of dollars in fines and do and do jail time um, even um, morning doves birds that are actually have hunting seasons on them if you shoot them outside of hunting season you can still be federally prosecuted so tell me about this hawk this is a red shoulder hawk um, and we are seeing their numbers increase in the area people are more familiar with the red tailed hawks and these guys are a little bit smaller um, they have red shoulders and very rust colored breast and of course no red tails they have a, a striped tail or barred tail um, and this one um, was found on a walking trail down by the river in Ashland City, had a very infected um, joint on its wing, which is basically the equivalent of our wrist joint. Um, and even though we attempted to, to treat it with antibiotic, the infection was so progressed by the time we got it that it had already compromise the blood supply to the rest of the wing and we had to amputate the tip of the wing it died off and so uh, you can't amputate any portion of a bird's wing and it still be able to fly so she is that's why she is non-releasable because we had to amputate that tip of her wing now tell me about this little guy here no no what's her name again uh, her name is Phoenix, and she is an American kestrel. That's full grown. They're the smallest falcon that we have in this area. Um, she and her brother were taken out of the nest um, right just as they hatched by people that were going to raise them. And you thought it would be a you know a great learning experience for the kids, you know, and all the stuff that you hear. Um, and unfortunately, they brought them to us when they were about to die. Uh, we weren't able to save her brother, but we were able to save her. And um, so she is, but she is totally imprinted on humans. And um, so that's why she can't be released into the wild. If you find a baby animal, any baby animal, the best thing to do, as long as it's not injured, is to get it back in the nest if possible, you know, a put back, a baby bird back in the nest, put a baby bunny back in the nest, as long as it's not injured. Um, the parents don't care about that. 
you know, they'd much rather have their baby back, and it's the best thing for the animal. I mean, we're pretty good at what we do, but we're not nearly as good as mom is. So how did Maisie uh, end up here, and how does one even go about um, uh, getting a raccoon or an animal and then bringing it to your facility? Any words of wisdom about how to do that if you find an injured animal? You know, it all kind of depends on what you've got, but, I mean, if you're driving along and you're you see something and you're stopped on the side of the road then you kind of are limited with what you have in your in your car so you know if if you happen to have a, a sheet and a pair of heavy gloves and a cardboard box you're in business you know or a dog crate but the you know if you're actually preparing to do this or you're at home and, and have time to gather some stuff you know a cardboard box a dog crate a laundry basket something along those lines a sheet a, a towel and some sort of gloves depending on what type of how big of the animal you're dealing with and you just want to throw the sheet or the towel over them it if they can't see that calms them down it decreases their stress and then lots of times you can just either bundle them up and get them in the box or you can use a broom or something to scoop them in the box or the crate um lots of times if the animal is really, really hungry and still mobile, if it's a mammal, then you can set a crate out there and put a can of cat food or, or whatever in there and it'll walk into the crate. Or you can use a have a heart trap. Um, but those, you know, the, the thing is, is that, you know, you don't want to get bitten. Um, and you have to know kind of what you're dealing with. If you're dealing with a bird of prey, then you want to watch out for the talons. Obviously, that's the business end of a bird of prey, you know. So you just kind of have to have a little bit of knowledge about, about what you're dealing with. Well, thank you so much, Bettina, for uh, taking us around uh, the Walden's Puddle. We really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for what you do. We certainly need more people like you uh, helping um, these defenseless and these injured animals. Uh, we're going to put on the bottom of our screen your website and also how people can donate and contribute to this worthy cause and thank you so much for having us and explaining uh, all of your all of your animals here at the Walden's Puddle. Sure and we certainly appreciate you all coming out and visiting us and giving us the opportunity to get the word out to more people. Um, for our website that has all the information on it, the emergency, what we call emergency care instructions. If anyone was to find an injured or orphan animal any time of day or night, they can always go to our website, access the emergency care instructions, tells them exactly what to do with that animal until they're able to get it to us. It also has our information on that about our volunteer programs, our internship programs, um, anybody that is interested in coming out and uh, volunteering with with us or interning with us um, and our wish list and, and how to donate. So it's kind of one-stop shopping for all your wild animal needs. Great. Well, thank you so much again. And this is Amber McDonald for The Walden's Puddle.